change. Oh, it's right here. Never mind. It was being hidden from me. Does this work? Hot dog. All right. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, our scripture passage that we will be addressing today comes to us in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 24 going through 35. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord today. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about what your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Heavenly Father, as we consider this teaching that you have given us today, we ask that you would help us to put our trust in you so that our fears and anxiety will be banished from our hearts. In your heavenly name, amen. As the holiday season approaches, one thing I've learned about Christmas and the New Year's since becoming an adult, uh, and this is a secret to all you kids out there, by the way, so don't tell anyone, this is an adult secret just between you and me. The secret I've learned since becoming an adult about Christmas is that Christmas is expensive. It is expensive. I had no idea how much it costs to do Christmas. I didn't realize gifts cost money. I didn't realize that gifts for adults cost even more money. And as you get older, it's not enough just to get your parents' gifts. Siblings, friends, friends, siblings, siblings of friends, There's so many people to get gifts for. So today's message about worry and anxiety may seem appropriate for this time of year as the end of the year approaches and we think about our budgets. And this is just as much a message for you as it is for me. When we look at scripture, uh, we see a lot of negative prohibitions that come from Jesus. And the one that he gave more often than any other, is not, don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery. It was, fear not. Don't be afraid. He knew our human condition. He knew that all of us in our fallenness go through life on the edge of anxiety. In this passage, Jesus addresses the problem of fear and worry and anxiety. And as a youth pastor, I hear the word anxiety thrown around around a lot as like a catch-all term uh, from youth. It's usually a catch-all term for feeling stressed or or nervous. But the reality for our youth is unfortunately a lot more disturbing. The National Institute of Mental Health confirmed that in 2019, nearly one in three teens between the ages of 13 and 18 had experienced some form of anxiety disorder, which is defined as excessive anxiety and related to behavioral disturbances such as social anxiety, panic disorders, and OCD. This is a 20% increase over the past decade. Now, it could just be that they are diagnosing it more than they ever have, which could be true, but the reality is still the same. Our youth are anxious. I have heard a a spectrum of what they're anxious for. On one end, they're anxious because a girl they like didn't sit next to them at school. On the other end, it's as anxious as 
I fear what the world will look like when I'm an adult. Or I don't feel real meaning or purpose in life. And that gives me pause. If we're all honest with ourselves right now, this very morning, we all have specific anxieties and fears that are common to this life. Fears of illness, fears of loss of money, our job, our security, our grades, and so on. In this passage, Jesus addresses the anxiety and fears, and the conclusion is clear. Jesus does not want you to be anxious. It is not his desire that you fear the worries of this world. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, then you can be confident that these words this morning are for you, that you may overcome those fears. And so we look at some of the specific anxieties Jesus addresses, particularly in verse 25. Let me pull that up. Some that I am sure you are all familiar with. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? What does this mean? How are these words to help us? It's helpful to think about, first of all, why is it our tendency to be anxious over food and clothing? And when we think about it, there really are three things we would lose if we didn't have food and clothing. First, we would lose some pleasures. Food tastes good. It's a pleasurable meal. I ate a pound of green bean casserole on Thursday. It was amazing. We would lose those pleasures if we didn't have food. Second, we would lose some human praise and admiring glances if we didn't have nice clothes, something wonderful to wear. And third and most obvious, we would lose a long life if we had no food at all or weren't protected from the cold with warm clothes. So we get anxious about food and clothing because we don't want to lose the physical pleasures or the human praise or a long life. And to this, Jesus responds. If you are gripped by anxiety over these things, you have lost sight of the greatness of life. Life was not given primarily for physical pleasures, but for something far, far greater, the enjoyment of God. Life was not given primarily for the approval of man, but for something far, far greater, the approval of God. Life was not even given primarily for a long life on earth, but for something far, far greater, Eternity with God and his kingdom to come. We ought not to be anxious about food and clothing because food and clothing cannot provide the great things, the enjoyment of God, his favor, and the hope of his eternity to come. We get anxious about life to the same extent that we fail to focus on what God has provided. We get anxious about life to the same extent that we fail to focus what God has provided. So it seems it's it's not enough to just not worry. It's not enough just to, to not worry. Our focus, our delight, should go beyond the things this world can provide. Because life is more than these things, as Jesus says. In fact, if food and clothes were all there is to your life, If food and clothes were all there is to your life, if being comfortable and having human favor and prolonging life was all there was, you should worry. Those things can be taken from you. So you need to grab them and hold on to them like your life depended on it. That's what pagans do. Jesus says in verse 32, for the pagans run after these things. So when you worry about these things, How are we different from the world? 
how would an unbeliever see any hint that you believe your life is more than this age? To worry about the same things that the world does is to say you only trust in the security that the world can provide. You can only find happiness in the things the world has to offer. So how, as a Christian, do I not worry about these things? They're in, my, they're in my heart, they're in my head. How do I not worry about these things? Well, before Jesus arrives at his conclusion, and really his, his thesis statement for this whole passage in verse 33, Jesus provides two examples of where to look for inspiration. His first inspiration comes in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? What we see when we look at the birds is not a lesson in laziness. They dig their worms, they get their bugs, they make their nests, they sing their songs. But Jesus says it is that God is the one who feeds them. Birds don't behave as though God will provide for them today and not tomorrow. Birds don't anxiously hoard things for a day when everything goes wrong. They go about their work as though when the sun comes tomorrow, God will still be God. How much more should we reason then that since we are not birds, but beloved children of God, that he will mercifully provide for us tomorrow. So we ought not to be anxious because the birds have taught us that God can be counted on to work for us tomorrow just as much as today. Second reason Jesus gives is very similar. We see it in verse 28 through 30. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was just like one of these. A flower has no desire of its own, yet it grows beautifully and ornately because God desires it to and provides as such. How much more a child of God will he not dress you in splendor? And I hear the retort. I don't feel beautiful or look ornate. Just last week, mind you, I'm 28 years old. Just last week, uh, I got a pimple on my cheek. And I, like a good mature adult, put a pimple patch on it. My wife was so proud. You were proud of me, weren't you? She was proud. I put a pimple patch on me. And then not two days later, when I took it off, there was another pimple right next to it. My wife called it Twin Peaks. When we do not feel beautiful or innate, we must be careful because that is often when we start defining ourselves by the world's standard of beauty. But the Bible paints a different picture. Beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. God has promised to close us with robes of glory in the kingdom that comes. So there it is, two inspirations of why we're not to worry presented by Jesus, and yet the passage doesn't end there. We remember, it's not enough to just not worry. Jesus provides something else in mind in verse 33 that goes beyond, don't fret about it. And this verse really is the summary of his whole Sermon on the Mount. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is talking about priorities. He said, seek first, protos, first in the order of importance, the kingdom of God. Everything else is secondary. It's a simple 
values evaluation. You've heard people say cynically, money isn't everything. It's the only thing. Or money isn't everything, but it's way ahead of whatever is in second place. In first place, in the value system of God, is seeking his kingdom. Unbelievers do not seek after God. They do not seek his kingdom. Seeking the kingdom of God is the activity of the disciples of Jesus because they know. They know that the things of this world do not compare in value to what God has in store. Seeking the kingdom of God is the activity of the disciples of Jesus because they know that the troubles of this world are not, as Paul says in Romans 8, worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Jesus addresses the specific fears and anxieties we encounter when he said, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. And truly, I I doubt there is any commandment of God I have broken more frequently in this life than this commandment. Um, And I know uh, a few people that truly aren't happy unless they have something to worry about, and sometimes that's me. But Jesus says, as king of that kingdom he speaks, fear not, because I am with you. The kingdom of that kingdom we are told to seek has told us to not worry because as king, he is with us and for us. If I knew with full assurance every second of every day in my life that Jesus was right next to me, what would I be afraid of? Why would I be afraid of anything? The psalmist says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And what was the reason he gave? It's because he wasn't afraid of death? Because he was happy in the shadows? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. To live the Christian life means to focus on the Word of God and the kingdom of God, so that we become more and more aware of the presence of Christ with us. Jesus says, I am with you always. I am with you on the battlefield. I am with you in the hospital. I am with you in the ambulance. I am with you in the cemetery. I am with you when the bank notice comes from foreclosure. I am with you always at the ends of the earth. For the the late Reformed theologian R.C. Sproul, this was his father's favorite text, Seek First the Kingdom of God. Favorite text in the whole Bible, R.C. Sproul's father. R.C. Sproul says, I watched him die over a period of three years with four strokes, and the fourth one killed him. For most of that time, he was confined to a chair with a magnifying glass that he used to read his Bible. My father had much to be anxious about. He was not earning any money. He was not able to care for his family. He did not know whether his kids were going to college. He did not know if he was going to survive another week. He would murmur to me with gnarled speech and a sagging jaw, be anxious for nothing. What you should eat, what you should drink, what you should put on. I would hear him say that, and I was amazed because he was not anxious, and I was. He clung to this text to the very end of his life. When we become disciples of Jesus, the concerns of this world, they do not go away. But what does change is our attitude towards those concerns. As Jesus says, the pagans run around concerned about all these things. 
But you, child of God, are given so much more. You are given a promise that the evils and hurts and brokenness of this world will come to an end. You are given a promise that the sufferings of this world will cease and you will be crowned in glory. And you are told that in the midst of those sufferings, God is with you. Seeking after the kingdom of God is the main business of the Christian life. Seek the kingdom of God and the rest will be added unto you. Amen. And as we think about the ways that God has blessed us, God has sustained us, and as we are called to seek the kingdom, we remember that we are not deserving of it, of those good gifts to be called to his kingdom. And yet he invites us to that anyway. And so we will enter into a time of prayer and reflection. First with a time of confession to remember that though we are not deserving, that God has given us forgiveness And then from that into a time of personal reflection between you and God, and from there into the Lord's Prayer. So would you join me in reading together from the screen our confession. Holy God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. Despite your gift of salvation through Jesus and the freedom you offer us in Christ, we remain captive to lies and fear bound by ways that lead to death. We confess that we are so often selfish and short-sighted, quick to judge and slow to forgive. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We turn away from the cries of the oppressed and are indifferent to the calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse your creation. Forgive us, God of mercy, by the power of your spirit. Renew in us a desire to love you with all we are and all we have, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And Lord, we lift up our concerns and prayers and our hearts to you. Heavenly Father, we recognize that we are quick to forget. We are quick to forget the good things that you have given us, quick to forget the grace that you have provided, quick to forget that you are enough. So Lord, we thank you for the season and holiday of Thanksgiving where we took time to remember all that you have given us in light of the fact that we are broken and messy. And Lord, as the ultimate giving of grace to us, you sent your son Jesus to die a death on the cross for us so that we may be right with you. So Lord, we thank you for those things, but also recognize that our world is broken and there are many, many things on our hearts that concern us. Lord, many of us are concerned financially. We are concerned about relationship, about about health, about our loved ones. Lords, in the midst of all those things, we ask that you would be near to us. That your spirit would encourage us, give us comfort and peace in the midst of the suffering. Lord, we thank you that you have promised, promised us wonderful, amazing things. Things that we cannot even imagine. Help us to cling to that hope, to remind us of what you have done for us, to remind us what you have promised. That we may finish this race. That you may look at us one day and say, well done, good and faithful servants. So Lord, we lift these things to you today and we pray the same prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.